We'll record and then, you know, we'll riff a little bit. Nice. How's your week going? It's going pretty well. Um, Jill posted some YouTube videos. We're, like, getting some some content and some marketing down. So I'm excited to do part two, have a couple new leads. Sounds like Bobby's making some progress, too, which is pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, he's always moving. <laughs> that guy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm super pumped to hop into part two here. Um, I think what we could do is kind of start getting into the end of prolific, unless you want to start talking about still the middle, I would say like you raised some capital in there. I don't know where you wanted to like pick up, but I have some thoughts. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool with whatever. If you think there's gaps, uh, where we were, like I'm ready to pick up where we were and keep filling it in. Well, I think there's like some, like, I think some people would be really interested to hear like what your biggest clients were. And then also like at this point, and then also like you guys raise capital. And I think that's super interesting. I think a lot of startups would vibe with that. And I think as a service company, the fact that you raise capital is kind of unique in a sense. Um, I don't know if you have any numbers or, or like stories around that time, but yeah, I would love to dig into that if you're open to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we took a little bit of investment from uh, Omnicom through Critical Mass, which was an agency out of Calgary, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I forget the number. I don't even know if I'm supposed to say the number, but... I'll say it. <laughs> so maybe Or we can maybe do forgetting. We can bleep it. <laughs> you know, forgetting <laughs> kind of convenient, I guess. You know, it was probably like a couple million or something like that. Um, that's awesome though took- and what what that go towards like what did that what did that fuel why did you guys as a service company decide to take money i mean you know you know how it is when you're uh living solely on what you're taking home from clients like yeah you don't you don't have a lot of breathing room so it was it helped us grow um helped us get a new office we you know we had um we moved into an office that had like a much bigger capacity, which where you ultimately visited us was uh, 77 Sand Street in Dumbo. Yeah. And that could fit, I forget the capacity, but you remember how that was. It kind of like had this horseshoe shape to it and you could have like 80 people in there, maybe more. So that was huge. The previous office, we like squeezed, I think like 40 or 50 people in there. And it was, I don't know how we did it. It was not big enough for that. (laughs) <laughs> um, also in Dumbo, we, we were always in Dumbo, so we're just kind of moving from building to building. Um, so yeah, re- getting getting that uh, investment was huge for you know giving us uh, some capital to play with there. That's awesome. So yeah, it sounds like like because like you mentioned, if somebody misses an invoice or something small happens. It's tough. Like it's a tough life taking home what like there's no wiggle room, like you said. So it can be scary for sure. Um you mentioned something. Well, two things. I think you brought up 77 Sand Street. I think this is probably a good time to address two things. One, we're wearing different clothes. So this is part two. <laughs> just like just like pops. <laughs> um, I, I can't wait to see how you transition. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe do like I don't a know cheesy how we're gonna like do it. it's gonna be a like, cheesy like magic dust thing and then we're just wearing different things in different rooms <laughs> or the star wars Wait, I love transition that. yeah <laughs> well, it's like the boomerang like da, 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 da. <laughs> you know what i'm talking about yeah somehow <laughs> for like scooby do or something like that where the boomerang like comes in that's gonna be the segue between collared shirts and whatever we're both wearing now so um yeah we're wearing different clothes so this is part two and I think part two could be more about like the second half of the journey, right? Like the beginning was more about your startup, how you got there. Now it's about scaling, growing, selling, things like that. And also, I think it's a good time to probably segue into like how we actually met because you brought up 77 Sand Street and that was my introduction to Prolific. And I think that's pretty interesting because um, you were a big inspiration behind 1.7. So, and it's funny how I hope I inspire the next person, but I think that's really cool that you without probably even knowing it at the time lit a fire for me. So yeah, at the time, like how I, uh, this is going to be a long story. Is that cool? Absolutely. I've been blabbering. Okay. So cool. Now it's your turn. 
<laughs> I feel bad talking on your podcast, but yeah. So, um, on your interview, but so how I came into like how I was introduced to prolific was I was 20, I think at the time and my college was a coding Academy. So I went to a coding Academy to learn to be a developer after a failed startup. Um, and at the end of the three month boot camp, month four was like career day. And so they wanted to show you what jobs were in the industry. Um, because I think a lot of people were transitioning adults, like tra- transitioning career adults, um, coming maybe from hospitality or other industries, and then me using it as college. And so I didn't actually know what jobs were really out there, like thinking about it. Like in my head, I was always going to come out and just start building what I wanted to. I didn't think I was going to have to get a job. Ended up interviewing at places like Spectrum. But um, the career day was like, hey, we're going to go check out this agency. So we're, I was pretty pumped. We did an offsite. We all hopped in the subway together. I remember like who I was with. It was a lot of fun. It was cool to get out of the classroom and and go over to, to Dumbo. So yeah, we hop on uh, the subway. We all go together. I remember at the time I was still so poor that I couldn't afford the subway fare. So I hopped the thing when my classmates were like, dude, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> what are we doing here? Um, and so we pull up to Brooklyn. I guess remember literally seeing 77 Sand Street, like the number 77, I think on the door, I think it was like just a blank number. And also that was like sevens are big for me. So I was like, whoa, (laughs) like this is amazing. And we go upstairs and yeah, there had to be. Yeah, it's lucky numbers for me. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. I was 17 in sports growing up. I was 77 in sports. We're called one seven now. So yeah, it was just like lucky numbers. Um. And I remember like pulling up, and I think you guys were on the third floor. I don't know. You were on some floor. Tenth floor, I believe. Tenth yeah, floor. Tenth floor. Yeah, you were high. Yeah, you're right. And I, you had a cool view. And yeah, there were probably 80 people in there. And I remember walking in, and you guys had like a logo wall. Do you remember like that logo wall? Yep. Oh, I wonder where that there thing was is. Like some... Who has that? You I should find that. that yeah. That was amazing, though, because I saw like, I think you guys had BlackRock on there. You had Lululemon for sure. You had SoulCycle. Um, you had huge yeah. brands. And it was like on this green ivy wall. And I like walk in. And I'm like, what the fuck am I looking at? <laughs> I'm like, this is Yeah, so it was cool. like <laughs> it had the app icons of clients. So it must have had Mod Cloth on there, like Old Navy, Gap. Uh, we, we had like yeah, a bunch of retail clients. Yep. Uh, Abercrombie was one of them. Uh yeah. You mentioned SoulCycle, American Express, we worked with. Wow. Edward Jones, Lily Pulitzer, Build. Scott's com. Miracle Grow. Scott's Miracle Grow, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. That yeah, was the team it, I talked was... to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, they are doing <laughs> cool stuff. It was like a lawn yeah. care program app. That was really cool. So, yeah, that was oh, yeah, there was some cool fans on there. That was really cool. And like, so like, do you remember, like you had major clients at this point, like you said, Amex, do you remember like what you did for BlackRock, for example? Like, what was that project about? BlackRock. Oh man. I kind of forget. Blending together a little too much in my head. <laughs> you had 80 people. Like, point. you were probably a different team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't work directly on the BlackRock one. Was that a San Francisco one actually? Uh, mm. probably cut this out <laughs> no that's Damn fine it. no but yeah so we pull up and all these logos are on there right and i was like blown away i'm like wait what are we walking into because it's so funny at the time i didn't even know what an agency was like i didn't really understand that so they immediately like shuffle us into like some glass room right in the center of the whole place kind of like by the back wall do you remember like where that was it's like all yeah. glass yep yeah you walk in to the right it was the the conference room to the left were smaller yeah. rooms that you could work in and they all had little TVs, little meeting rooms. Yeah. 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 So they put us all in the center one and right outside with the Scott's Miracle Grow team. And I don't think they planned anything, honestly. They're like, ah, oh, shit, these guys are here. We got to talk <laughs> to them. They pulled the girl, the PM right off the, the pod because there was like, a, they were sitting in a pod and they're like, hey, can you come talk to these guys real quick? And then she like was like, oh, shit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and she comes in and yeah that was where i was first introduced to an agency i was like oh my god like 
She told us about the the client, Scott's Miracle Grow. I was shocked that they even needed software. Like that blew my mind a little bit too. I was like, what are they hiring you guys for? Like, I don't understand. And that kind of opened my mind to like the diversity of clients as well. They came in, she talked about everything. I thought she was an engineer and then I just realized she was a project manager. And by the end, because I just didn't understand anything. I was like, wait, how much do you make? Because again, I just wanted to get into this industry. She goes, $70,000. And I've never seen $70,000 in my entire life. I was like, you get paid $70,000 to not even code? And she was <laughs> like, fuck you. <laughs> but she, was, she should she have said it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I love She's that like, story. Who are you? That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny to think that like while I was figuring things out, like you were – running this company you were probably running around in some meeting or doing something right in that same office um which i found really crazy that our paths kind of crossed maybe like yeah. you we we're in the same space and now here we are years later so yeah so why don't you just quickly tell that story because that's the first interaction i had with prolific and then ever since that i was obsessed with you guys and i just started to follow you guys for the entire time i was building one seven and i saw you guys sold and I was like, wow, like, this is really cool. I think I followed you guys on LinkedIn or whatever. I was just like really intrigued by the whole thing. And you guys were always like this North star. And then I think maybe a year or so after I reached out on LinkedIn and I just like wanted to chat with you. Um, and that's kind of how it started. I remember it was like in the pandemic, I was living at my mom's house. Like I had to move out of New York to pay the employees and I had to stop paying myself just to keep the thing going. And, um, having your conversations with you was like the highlight of my weeks because I was just like, Oh, like I felt like one, you got it. You understood it. You built this thing Two, It was just cool to like, yeah, be able to relate to somebody. And you were again, like my like idols, like you guys, you and Bobak were like the coolest things ever to me. So I was just like, wow, this is so cool that we get to chit chat about this stuff and like talk tech. So that's how we met. And that's how I was introduced to prolific. Just thought I'd drop that little, you know, story in there. Damn. Well, so, I appreciate that. That's yeah. I, no, I didn't, I didn't realize I, I, to me, I, I thought you were just like on LinkedIn. You're like, Oh yeah, I know who this is. I'll just reach out and like have a conversation. Like you're just, but I didn't realize that you were following the company. I actually thought we were cool. So we tried oh, yeah. to, which is fantastic. Glad our marketing worked somehow. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled up your guys site all the time. Like I talked about it all the time. Yeah. It was, it was really cool to me. And especially you guys also segued a lot in your brand story over the years from like servicing startups to servicing startups and enterprises to just servicing enterprises pretty much. Yeah. And I remember seeing that and kind of watching it and realized that startups is probably a good niche for me. Um, so I thought that was cool. Like what made you – so at the time, let's kind of maybe dive back into you. So sorry for that side note. But I wanted to just like connect the dots there. It sounds like you had huge clients at the time. You guys raised some capital. You grew a lot. You had offices in North Carolina, correct? Dumbo in San Francisco by the yep, end? Yep, that's correct. Durham, North Carolina. Smaller office there. Cool. Um, yep. And then San Francisco had like 25 or so people. And then there was, you know, 7 to 80 or so over in Brooklyn. Yeah. So with clients like Amex, with like huge brands like Gap, what made you want to sell? Like, why did you get to the point that you were like, I think we should sell? I think so. So the backstory with WeWork was, um, first of all, there, there was people that we'd worked with uh, on other clients, like SoulCycle and other ones that had gone over to WeWork. And um, they picked us up for a project. Uh, and it was called WeWork Now. And um, it was kind of like this pilot project for them where they create like a retail space right off the street um, in the Flatiron District, I believe it was. And, um, you know, anyone could walk in. Their model at the time or before that was you needed a membership in order to enter into a WeWork and you'd go up the elevators and, you know, the whole typical WeWork experience. This was the first time where they were opening it up to the public and we were creating uh, the app that allowed anyone to book a seat there. And they could go in. There was mm -hmm. a coffee shop. They also had products that WeWork members had created, uh, which it was a really cool spot. It, um, 
and it worked pretty well, the prototype. So that's kind of like how the door kind of opened up there was uh, creating that app. And, um, you know, Adam Newman would crash our meetings and stuff like that. Really? So that's how we cross paths. Yeah. Guy would just walk into a meeting and give speeches. It was, it was interesting. And what was that like? Like, cause he was very on the new technology stuff, right? Cause I think he was pushing before this whole debacle, like he was pushing, we work to be more of a technology company. So like, yeah. what was he doing in your meetings? No, you, you know, you know him, he, uh, he just, he loves to be inspirational. So he would come in and he would talk about the future of work and other such things. I think, uh, mm. I don't think I listened to the whole speech. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, he, were you rolling he, your eyes even then? Sorry to interrupt you. I'm not capable of rolling my eyes. Of course not. <laughs> were, but like, were you like, um, were you kind of under the spell at that time? Or were you even at that time? Were you like, I'm zoning out? Like, what are we listening to? I think like, a lot of people were. Yeah. I think once, um, once the conversation kind of opened up for being acquired by them, I was like, well, all right, I better pay attention. Like, what are the actual opportunities here? And I think the whole the whole idea that um, WeWork was was this platform, almost a physical platform for entrepreneurs across the world. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Like, it's it, in a way, it's a it's a big entrepreneurial network of people that you know mm. WeWork is the hub of. So there could be some really interesting things to come of that and they had all these ambitions of like expanding what the company did uh which now is more of something they're infamous for but back then it was like oh wow they're trying to do a lot which means there's a lot of mobile projects and so maybe it does make sense for them to acquire us um mm -hmm. so maybe my bs meter was off maybe something i, I don't know but it seemed kind of cool okay that's interesting so why but like did they approach you guys first or were you guys feeling internally like, Hey, we had a good run. We're probably nine or 10 years in now. Like, let's think about doing something different. Like, was this a conversation that they, did they plant the seed in your head or were you guys already thinking about this? They, they planted the seed in our head. Oh, so really? We weren't, yeah. We weren't trying to make that happen. We just kind of, kind of landed on our laps. Wow. Yeah. Really? So they came to you and they, you guys weren't thinking about it at all. You were going to keep doing your thing for until the, the wheels fell off. I mean, we were always open to opportunities, but we weren't shopping necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And how did that go down? Like, how did that um, get bro? besides like the projects being kind of the way in? Who like it sounds like Adam Newman or whoever approached you. What did that mm -hmm. look like? I wasn't there for that. It was uh, Adam approaching Bobak. So really, I wasn't there for that moment. Yeah, uh, but you know, I came and asked for that and started talking to them. Wow. Yeah, did you have other options on the table? I think so. I'm trying to think. Well, you know, we we had the relationship with Omnicom. So yeah, that was another potential thing. Um, yeah, but WeWork ended up making more sense for, for everyone. Was Omnicom like pushing you guys to sell at all? Like to get an ROI on their investment or they didn't really care? No, they, they were still, you know, they were, they had people on our board and that sort of thing. Uh, they were working with us just to make the company more profitable. And that was kind of like, that was the path we were on because um, mm -hmm. we certainly didn't build the company to be super efficient initially. You know, we were growing really fast and figuring out the model and um, you know how it is with product teams. It's not necessarily the most efficient way to, to get profit out of being an agency. So we're, we're tweaking that model mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, they were working with us on, on that. Interesting. Yeah, because there's a lot of opportunity to have a really high revenue, but not always profit. Like it's a lot of overhead in order to achieve like high revenue. So that's interesting that they came to you and were like, hey, we actually think we can make this more efficient. Absolutely. Wow. And, you know, we were willing to take ideas from how they worked, which I think 
it was a little bit less, uh, you know, pod based or team based, however you want to put it, and a little mm-hmm. more, a little more traditional. Which, um, I guess, when you scale to that size, it's a little bit easier to kind of be more department based and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. For sure. So then, you guys, what year is this like potential acquisition on the table? That was 2019. So, so the sale went through like July 1st, 2019. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Pretty close to the pandemic. That is wild. Yeah. So this happened yeah. right before the pandemic, it sounds like. And like, like, how did that, I guess, like deal go down in sense of like, what were the terms? Like, what was it an aqua hire? Or was it just like a straight acquisition? Like, what, I guess, what did the structure of this deal look like? I mean, yeah, when we, yeah, it, it was pretty much an aqua hire. Um, yeah, it's not like there was a prolific division of we work all of a sudden, like we kind of, you know, different people went to different teams and that kind of, that kind of thing, um, which is, which was a little upsetting, you know, like we, we definitely felt like we, we built a cool way of working and that uh, there was like a prolific way that could have added value if it was kept intact. And it kind of just, it uh, diffused pretty quickly into just like, you know, people being on different teams as individuals. Uh, oh, wow. So that, that part wasn't, was not awesome that, you know, kind of like the soul of prolific didn't really remain intact. Uh, yeah. So Acquire, short answer to that. And what do they want? The technology teams? They, they just needed mobile capabilities, you know, people mm-hmm. that knew, I mean, if you went on there, went onto the app store and looked at their apps, they all had really low ratings and all that sort of thing. And they're struggling to iterate and, um, you know, pretty much from every angle from design, engineering, product angle, like they, they needed help. So it made, it made a lot of sense in that regard. Wow. So you and Bobak get approached by the WeWork team. What was, and I'm sure they planted the seed a bunch. Like it, I'm sure overnight you weren't just like, yes. But like, what was the feeling when you guys decided to sell or th- when the wire came through? Like, what was your, what was your initial reaction? It was, you know, the process is super exhausting. I mean, we're, you can't just stop running the company. You can't stop selling. There's a chance that it actually doesn't go through even in the 11th hour. So, you know, you're balancing, getting all the materials ready. Uh, diligence is super intense. You know, there's lawyers on both sides and uh, people asking for certain documents and proof of this or, or that, um, you know, documentation about all your deals and all your assets. Uh, and it takes so much time to get that together and deal with the back and forth. Um, but you know, we had to keep acting like, uh, it was a business that was going to keep going, which it very well could have been if it didn't, if it didn't go through. Yeah. Did you tell anybody? Yeah. Yeah. we kind of slowly got the news out there, which was tough. Like, in a, in a way we were lying by withholding that information, you know, like not everyone knew. So like it kind of felt like lying a little bit, which kind of took its toll a little bit. So, you know, when we were finally able to tell everyone that was a relief, um, getting that out there, not everyone was happy about it. That's for sure. Um, you know, some people already had a bad taste in their mouth about we work. A lot really? of people saw the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. There was a mixed reaction. Yep. Um, which is how it is. You know, you're not going to have a hundred percent of people buying into a move like that, but yeah, it was a relief once it was out there. I find that really interesting because at the time we work was the golden child of the VC and startup world. So like, I'm, why did some people have a bad taste in their mouth? I mean, they're early on in WeWork, those stories about like their parties and stuff like that. Um, they definitely had a party culture and, um, 
yeah, I, I think maybe it's okay when you're starting out to be in a company that, you know, uh, has booze on the table from the night before when you show up, that kind of thing. But, you know, at some point you outgrow that and it's not a, not a great culture to be in. And I think they, uh, that, that reputation followed them around for a little while. Wow. But yeah, I, I think at the time we got acquired by WeWork, like they'd moved on from that. Uh, when we showed up July 1st, it was nothing like that. You know, it was honestly a bunch of smart badasses at WeWork. And, um, you know, they're working super hard on all the products and everything like that. So, yeah. That's really cool. And what made you say yes? Like, was this a life-changing amount of money for you? Um, were you tired? Was it all of the above, none of the above? It was, it was more so a combination of like, yes, this is an opportunity and also being tired, I think played into it mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I think like the process itself had its toll, like I said, also. So that by the end of it, it just made it made it somewhat easier to just be like, okay, yeah, this is this is the next move. Wow. So this felt like a natural progression for you. Um, you were tired. Agency stuff is really tiring. Like I totally relate. Like I understand that for sure. Um, yep. And so you and Bobak were like, it'd be great to take some risk off the table. Maybe have some money in our bank and work for somebody else. Yeah, I mean, sure, uh, cashing out for all the years we put in was was a pretty cool thing, I guess, but it wasn't like, wasn't top of mind, wasn't the primary thing. Um, I think we just, we always had like that pure, raw, just wanted to create cool stuff and motivation and like that, that was always going to be the primary thing in our heads. I like that because I think when you lead with money, you always get, you don't attract the right energy, but it is always top of mind because you need the money as like the fuel for the car. If you run out of money, you run out of fuel. So it's like, it's a push and pull because you don't want to think about money. You want to build things for the right reason. But if you don't optimize for cash flow or, or bring in the right profit profitability each year, like the car doesn't start. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we did get to a point where we were um, profitable enough to like pay ourselves a respectable amount of money. So That's cool. What was that looking that helped like? Too. I, what's that? What was that looking like? Are you allowed to disclose numbers? Uh, I think it was or like majors. 150. I think we gave ourselves like a 150K salary, which was great. We we're like, wow, salary. We're 29 pretty concerts. great, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Which, you know, you, you brought up like, was money a motivation with the deal? I think that's one of the reasons you do pay yourself is that you're not tempted just by random opportunities. You know, you could live comfortably, um, which is good for your mental health. Of course. Um, I think if you, for a decade, just don't pay yourself. I think that takes a mental toll at some point. So yeah. I think it's important eventually. Um, I don't know where you're at with this, but eventually to at least be comfortable. It's you know not about becoming rich. It's about being in a place where you could make sane decisions, make strategic de decisions without your personal comfort being a main factor uh, when you're making that decision. Relate so hard. Like I think in the beginning not having any money fuels a lot of the fire because your back's against the wall. And I feel like some people I do well personally when my back's against the wall, but there also becomes a point where having no money or like any comfortability whatsoever, you start also making bad decisions because um, you're like really desperate in a sense and it, it can't help but seep in. Like you can't, you're not in any power position when it comes to like negotiation or whatever. You have to say yes. And I think it eventually leads to bad decision making. So mm -hmm. I get that. Like having some money in the in the bank sometimes lets you be sometimes too comfortable. Some people become too comfortable. 
and they lose the drive. But other people, I yep. feel like, from what I've seen, like are able to now think clearly and be like, all right, we don't need to jump at this opportunity. I don't know if that relates at all to you. That is a way better way of saying what I was trying to say. That's 100%. <laughs> you did great. Yeah. Right. I just thought about this stuff a lot. I also I listen to other podcasts where people talk about this where, yeah, because when you get a lot of money, you can become fat and happy, right? Like if the kind of saying is. And um, or you can think clearly and then not have to be so desperate. So, yeah, I think I'm kind of like in between where it's like, we talked about personal finance at the beginning of this, where I'm I'm in this era of like obsessing over like just being a little bit more comfortable, like getting a car, living in a nice city like Miami, getting a nice apartment, right? And like being able to do this for the long term, because also if you're still sleeping on a futon like I was in New York, like you're not going to sustain that very long. You're going to crash and burn pretty soon. So yeah, I, I totally hear you. Um wanted to bring up one thing that I think you told me a long time ago, wanted to see if this was true or not. When you were getting ready to sell, was a deal with Shopify on the table? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> Just forget, forget that. <laughs> well, it wasn't on the table at the time. Yeah, that was another one of those things that kind of came up. And it was it was just like, kind of came out of nowhere. And we're like, okay, if we're going to sell, we need to look at what else is out there. And um, yeah, it, they didn't like that too much. It, um, I mean, it, it, was a, it was a pretty good deal. Um, I forget the exact numbers. And I don't know if I'm allowed to disclose them either. But that's okay. Yeah, it was I'm pretty just good. At it I'm trying to make this a podcast where like we talk numbers real, real, because I think there's a lot of mystique around finance and numbers. So I'm trying to make it real. But yes, no, I if you're not comfortable, don't disclose it. I'm well, I'm also not prepared. I like totally forget these numbers. Um, and I yeah, I don't even know the legality around me talking about it. I don't know if the NDA mm -hmm. is still in place mm -hmm. or whatever. So no worries. Next, we'll get a time Jill, we'll, we'll swap Jill out as the producer with the lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I should have thought about that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. It, there we'll chop everything. We'll run the cash on the plate. Chop it. Yeah, say that again. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I was saying we'll run this whole thing past you and chop things that you want us to. So don't worry. Okay. We'll be left with the first two minutes. Hi. Hello. <laughs> 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 and then yeah, it skips yeah. to the end all right good talking yeah good talking <laughs> thanks it's just two minutes different shirts and then the outro that's right <laughs> oh man but sorry so you let's... so to recap you were when you had the we work on the table you're like oh we should probably shop this around real quick sounds like you pissed off we work a little bit when you did that and then something with shopify came on the table we, which was we like pissed off of shopify that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, Shopify gave us a deal, um, decent amount of equity, and that was shortly before their stock went through the roof. So, I don't not think about that sometimes. Uh, that's real. I love that. <laughs> would have yeah, been a good stock. Like, like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, like what would we have been building, that kind of, that kind of stuff. I don't know. but I bet you can hit them up and just be like, hey, want to jam? What's jam? I bet you could get back in there. No, they probably hate us. They're, we're on, we're on a dartboard. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. So they have our face on a on a curling. Uh, what do you call it? A court. And the, yeah, yeah. The, uh... <laughs> have you tried to enter Canada in the past five years? You might not be allowed. Oof! I was supposed to go to a wedding, but got COVID. Uh, last year, oh. uh, you've been arrested being more. Detained, It seems. Yeah, <laughs> they the, uh, Shopify owns the the border. Yeah, <laughs> the border agents. <laughs> Scary. They're greasing palms everywhere. Damn, can't go there. <laughs> but it sounds like that was on the table, so that's interesting. And then you was this before we work or after we work? The Shopify thing, yeah. Oh yeah, it was well, it was well before the WeWork thing. Oh okay, okay. So it wasn't at the same era at all. 
Like how many years before would you say? I think it would be a year before we started talking. Oh, about wow. Yeah. It wasn't like in the same process, I don't think. Then again, my internal timeline is kind of screwed up. No, interesting. That's so fascinating. I thought it was happening at the same time. It sounds like so Shopify planted this whole seed a year or so prior. And then this became real again with WeWork. So that's really interesting. Sounds like you guys were tired and the deal was more of an aqua hire. Was there any, was it like cash and equity or like what, what were the final terms of this thing? Yeah, it was, was cash it and equity. Cash? Okay. Cash and equity, a little more equity than cash. Uh, which is the opposite of the way Shopify went with their stock, of course. But interesting. Yeah, it worked out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. So you guys sell, it becomes an aqua hire. It sounds like it closed July 1st. What does July 1st look like? Are you showing up at a new office? Like, walk me through that day. Yeah, it was a little bit bizarre. Um, it was like, we showed up for orientation, essentially, like sat at a wow. desk. Everyone got laptops and like, you know, created our email accounts and all that stuff. And uh, then walked over to our, our teams. So, you know, like during, well, during the process, like, the, you know, the acquisition process, we had to figure out what teams we'd work on, what stuff we'd work on. So July 1st, we knew where that was and who to show up to. So it was orientation and, and meeting our teams. So for the first time in 10 years, you're an employee again. Yes. What'd that feel like? I'm trying to remember, and it's probably hard to explain it or describe it. I, I think the whole thing, like I said before, was uh, was so tiring and kind of surreal. And that feeling of it being surreal kind of, you know, that day, it kind of, uh, kind of stuck. And uh, I think for me, I was just going through some motions, you know, it was like, okay, here's a Here's a room I have to show up to. Uh, a little weird because it's all former employees, you know, mm. that are with me. And uh, I don't know. It's, it is hard to describe. I can't imagine that, honestly. Like, I think when you're an entrepreneur, it's probably like against who, you, like, I don't know. Like, I would explode. You know what I mean? But I would understand that you have to do it, especially if you sold, right? You probably have like some two-year vesting, three-year vesting, whatever it is, right? Yep, <clears throat> exactly. So I get it. Um, but yeah, that's interesting to show up to your team, not as the leader, but like with your colleagues as peers, like yep. on the same level. Crazy. It wasn't. It wasn't so much like being officially peers. You know, it was. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't prolific anymore. It was like, it's gone. And uh, wow. kind of slowly digesting that. So did it, it hit was, you after? It was a strange time. I think it kind of gradually did. I was, surprisingly, I was able to show up and, um, you know, do work and everything. I think um, maybe numb myself to the weirdness of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it helped. It was a pretty cool team I was on. It was um, Member Insights. They this team created the recommendation engine for the home screen of uh, the WeWork member app, and uh, they were using machine learning, and they were super cool. It, it was a cool team. Maybe that helped. That's very cool. What did you do for them? Like, what was your new title? I think it was Senior Full Stack Engineer. Cool. So I wasn't so much creating machine learning models. I was kind of creating interfaces and backends to kind of tie it together. I was working on a uh, internal analytics tool um, for A-B testing. And uh, I think it was using like a Bayesian model or something crazy that one of the, uh, one of the guys cooked up on the team using math that I still don't, uh, still don't quite understand, but it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. 
That's very cool. So you're part of this team. How long are you there for? So a bunch of layoffs happened like nine to ten months later. And uh, uh, I was part of one of those waves. Wow. And actually around the time you reached out to me, it was when that happened. I remember you were tired. You told me too straight up. You're like, I'm pretty tired. Like, I'm going to be chilling for the next few years or like year. You're like, I just need to like decompress. And I actually respected the crap out of that. I was like, I get it. You kind of went through war in a sense for a decade. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely kind of bottled up some burnout. Uh, You know, there's like a couple tough months at the end I had a client that like was refusing to pay and I had been like burning myself out for three months trying to get their stuff done and uh it was like wow. yeah that got me a little bit uh but yeah you know like you kind of after a while you kind of grow numb to the ways that you're burning yourself out and every once in a while you might might even need help uh you might need someone to point it out to you um it's it's crazy i'm I'm sure you go through that too oh, i'm there yeah for sure i could definitely we could do a whole podcast talking about how to deal with that um which would actually be a great one about mental health and stuff that'd be pretty cool we should definitely chat about that if you're open to it but who was that for you who pointed that out to you oh i believe it was a therapist <laughs> good <laughs> for helps. you yeah, yeah. i got I mine too necessary. i've had her for six years Yep. No shame in it. It's no shame. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it was uh, before the WeWork deal that I hired a therapist because I was like, why all this stuff is happening and why am I, why am I not feeling like elated about it? Why am I not feeling much about it? And that's just burnout. Wow. So you felt nothing really around this deal. Like you said, it sounds like you were going through the motions. You showed up. That's, yeah, you weren't, didn't get to enjoy the sale. Um, and it stinks that it really got reconfirmed with the layoffs a few months later, which is no fault of your own. It's just the, the company was not built well. Or maybe it was my fault. What if I went in there and I'm, I'm the reason? They just forgot to include that in all those movies. <laughs> no, I think I don't think it was you. <laughs> I, I think it was you a lot of recognition <laughs> from Adam Newman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think like you did it probably I, a great job <laughs> i changed the line in the recommendation engine code and that blew up the company fucked it all up god damn it <laughs> my bad <laughs> yeah i think that's what caused um i think it was like 10 million dollars spend a month or something like that so yeah that's probably was it yeah yep all me <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i think uh i think you're fine but um so that's really interesting i did want to so I appreciate you going through that. I'm sure that was probably actually pretty painful to talk about. So I really do appreciate that. Um, and no, so not, not too bad. It, um, it's just, it's hard to remember all the, all the details. So it's kind of, that's why I'm rambling a little bit. I'm kind of walking through those times and trying to connect the dots. It's been a while. Oh, it's great. Yeah. And also, like you said, you were burned out. So going through the motions when you're burned out, like time doesn't really line up. Like you're kind of just like half there, you know? So, um, yep. And you're going through the motions from one organization to another. The saddest part to me was that you said like the brand and the culture and the identity of prolific was wiped away just by a single like merger. Like that's, that sucks because firsthand being an outsider showing up to your office, there was, there was something really there. Like there was a real energy and vibe that I've never felt again, really, except as we're trying to build one seven around it. So like it was legitimate and that's i can imagine what that was like as that was your every day so that is tough to hear yeah yeah i think that's true there was something special you know we definitely were not a perfect company i think um there's yeah there's a lot of things that made it a good company which probably could be its own podcast but i don't know yeah we should dive into that we should dive into some of these points at another one um but I know I want to kind of keep going through the journey. And part of it is like, I had two kind of questions. That was kind of where I wanted to wrap up the WeWork part. But I did want to see like, how have you seen the agency space 
change since 2010? I kind of, I feel like agencies and the whole landscape of, of being an agency, I think it's changed more because of COVID than it did since the, mm -hmm. since like 2009 when I started to yeah. when we sold, I think the change was more dramatic because of COVID. Um, before, if you were talking about if you're like remote or on site or whatever, like that was like a big differentiator. We'd be like, yeah, you could show up to our office, blah, blah. Now it's like, who cares? If, if you're, if you have a remote team, almost everyone does, right. Or it's, or it's hybrid or something like that. So that's no longer a thing. And that whole style of working is, uh, you know, the remote style of working, is kind of the norm, which you would know about more than me since you've kind of built the company that way. Yeah. And so you're saying now it's the norm to be remote. And is that what made you guys different was having an in-person in team? It certainly helped. It helped build the brand, you know, it helped clients would show up potential clients would show up and they would see the wall of um apps just like you did yeah. and, you know we could kind of design an experience that made them buy into prolific a little bit not saying like we bullshitted anything but like we had a little bit of control over how they felt with interacting with our brand and that's a physical office yeah right like that is a big piece of designing your brand is the physical touch points uh, yeah. when you have the opportunity to have physical touch points. So, yeah, I think that must have, I, I'm speculating a little bit because I'm not really in the agency world anymore, but I, th I think that'd be like, if, if prolific did not sell and we persisted through COVID and everything, we would have had to completely change the way the company worked Yeah, for sure. But in That's terms so of like, the, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, keep going, please, please. I'm just, so I'm just contrasting that with how things evolved from 2009 forward. I think I brought it up earlier where it's, you know, mobile is new. Uh, creating mobile products is kind of a new thing. You can't just take the same processes that you used before with creating websites creating ads and all, all the things that agencies had traditionally done. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't work too well with mobile. So there's kind of that transition period where we had to like keep pushing to work a little bit differently in order to deliver mobile products and deliver them. Well, like people would think of them as kind of like marketing campaigns and we're like, mm -hmm. no, this is like, this is like an interface to your customers that, that they have with them out in the world right? Like taking it out of their pockets, looking at it, trying to complete a task, like while they're standing on a street corner or something like that, that is not yeah. a marketing campaign. So, um, yeah, just convincing people to work differently and showing them that's where kind of show don't tell came from, uh, as one of our core values was like, you can't really explain it. You can't put it in a, in a keynote and that's not, you know, that's not gonna make the difference there. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that's kind of how things evolved um, from my point of view from 2009 when we first started forward. That, that's so interesting. There's so much to unpack there because it sounds like people when you first started thought of mobile as a marketing campaign. Like they thought of it as this is like, I'm sure you were starting to interact with CMOs instead of the CTOs, which you needed to be talking to in the beginning. It sounds like. Yeah, I, that sounds correct. Yeah, we were talking to a lot more marketing people initially. And then, yeah, a lot of CTOs. Wow. So you had to convince them that this is not a mobile ad in your pocket. This is a, like you said, uh, you're trying to get a task done or execute or, or perform something, maybe standing on a street corner. Yeah. Man, maybe wow. maybe street corner was the wrong thing for me to say. <laughs> so Standing on the street corner. Well, I imagine being but, about to go across a crosswalk in New York and you're like, oh shit, I got to check out of my Lululemon app. Like a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the example, Bodega, maybe a Starbucks. Bodega's it's like, one. yeah, the, the interface of a mobile app is so much different than a website. Like websites are these exhaustive, you know, big menus stretching across the screen, big hero images. You know, all this real estate to like, to try to, it's almost like in bigger 
companies, you know, you, different real estate, you have different departments like competing against the other departments. Yeah. You can't have any competition on the screen of the app. It has to be super clean, super tight, be super fast, even though it's, you know, using cell towers. Yeah. Um, it changes so much in terms of design and engineering. That's so interesting because you are on the cusp of web to mobile. So you're seeing that you had to be in the forefront and the subject matter expert in this. That's really cool. Initially, it was like we just sucked a little less than everyone else because it was so new. <laughs> like no one was an expert, right? So <laughs> just sucked a little, little less. Mm -hmm. That was the game. <laughs> I like that. And that, that's what made you great. You just sucked less and less and less each year until you were the best. That's right. That's the like glass a was one hundred percent not empty. That's how. It, <laughs> that's how it was. I like that. So that's really interesting, and I agree with you on the remote work stuff too. Like, it's a different game. I mean, when I, so I was two years, three years before COVID, and then three years after COVID. I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and yes, the whole business model in the beginning was New York people or Jersey City people had to be in person, had to have an office. And it's interesting how COVID made that completely acceptable to have a hybrid or remote team. Like I I was losing business because everyone wasn't in the office. <clears throat> I remember once I would ask friends to show up for client meetings to just fill up the room. Like, it, because it was just me half the time in an office. Cause I, I got lucky and somebody paid for my office in Jersey City. Like I he had an extra sandwich shop or sub shop and he gave it to me for free for two years. And then I'm like, this is great access to New York, whatever. But then I was just me sitting there. I'm like, oh shit, I could be at home. <laughs> um, wow. And I said, yeah, I'll tell that story another time. That was interesting. Oh, cool. But yeah, that was, that like changed my life a little bit too, for sure. Like he gave me a free office in Jersey city with access to New York. And so that like there was nobody there though it was really as soon as COVID happened and it was accessible to have people anywhere we kind of cut the whole u.s team honestly because also like mm. we were struggling like a lot of the startups that we were working with ran out of money or whatever so that's when i opened up ideas to like working with global talent for more affordable rates and that way we could also stay affordable for our customers so I hear you. Yeah, it became really acceptable, which also allowed us to survive at the same time. So really cool. And where do you think agencies are going to go in the future? Because if you guys were in this brink of web to mobile, what do you think what's going to be make them different going forward? Can I can I take a second? I just um, I have a ferry to catch at seven. So I'm just making sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry about this. Um, we're, we're, we're having fun. No worries. Yeah, your stories sound cooler than mine. No. <laughs> well, this they're... is partially why I'm a fan of you because of your story. Like, we have very similar stories in a sense. Like, we weren't planted by giant corporations, you know? Yeah. Like, very, like, just started from zero knowledge almost kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, it's forty-five minutes away to get there. So how much time? You time. It's a seven o'clock ferry. So where are you? Are you in the city? Rhode Island. Are you really? What part? Yeah, it's um South Kingston, I believe the town is. Do oh, you know okay. Rhode Island? Yeah, I used yeah, to go to. Um, I have like kind of an estranged grandfather. And they had a house in uh, right outside of Westerly in Watch Hill. So we used to go there mm. growing up. Um, yeah. And it was really cool. It was really cool. Was so, yeah, let's, let's give it like 45 minutes means we get there 6.15 right now. Yeah, like 15 more minutes. And if we need to do part cool. three, we have to do part three. <laughs> I think we, if you're down, I would love you to just keep coming back. like, And we just keep shooting the shit. I think like this is the hardest one because – we're unpacking you, like Eric Weber, the person. But I think like there's gonna be fun things we could talk about a little bit, like to like specific topics. Um, yeah. But uh, do we want to hop into if you're cool with jumping into your current phase, like what you're up to now? Absolutely. Cool. So, this is where I want to promote stuff um, and like talk about <laughs> what you're doing and all the fun stuff. So, 
tell me where you're what you're doing now. So you did this whole thing, you sold, you took a break. What are you up to now? So right now it's a combination of freelancing and I I didn't totally take a break. Uh, there's kind of been this idea I've been working on, uh, called concept engine for a while. And, um, Mm -hmm. pretty much like right after I got laid off from WeWork, I just started getting after it. And, um, yeah, it kind of started at prolific. I was, I was kind of running an internal R and D team and the way I wanted to run it wasn't so much where it was like just this team was figuring out cool things and telling everyone about it. I kind of want it to be this distributed thing where Mm -hmm. people across the company were discovering cool frameworks or new tech and like validating it and like able to share it. So I wanted to create like a knowledge graph platform there that anyone in the company could use. And then anyone could query the information from it. And not only that, but it could also include uh, data about, it could almost be like a social network where employees could put in like, you know, their skills, stuff they like to do, places they like to eat in the area, you know, all just whatever you want. And so it kind of got me down this rabbit hole where I was looking up what platform could possibly help me do that. So I kind of came across knowledge graphs that existed at the time, like Google uses a knowledge graph to augment their search results. So like, if you put in Einstein, a page will a sidebar will come up in the results for Einstein. We'll have all these facts. That's their knowledge graph powering that. Um, so I set off to like create my own. So I started playing with graph databases and that sort of thing. But my whole goal was for everyone in the company to use it. So that wasn't gonna, that wasn't gonna do the trick. Um, and then I kind of came across this new data structure that not many people are using it that I know of called nested hypergraphs. And okay. a nested hypergraph sounds fancy, but all it really is is just groups of concepts that, and like, for example, Eric knows JavaScript is a concept, and you could create concepts with that as part of those higher level concepts. So you could kind of like layer it. Um, and it maps really well to natural language. So almost anyone could create, could write it, write this language and add facts into the system or pull facts from it. So it kind of fulfilled this weird goal where it could store anything you could think of, but at the same time, it's super intuitive. So I I was like, wow, this has some really interesting properties. Um, I'm going to create stuff around it. So I got to this point last year where I was able to release the platform concept engine and, uh, we could put a link or something somewhere. Yeah. And, um, right here, you know, it, right here. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, they usually put it like in the uh, description of the episode or something like that's true. Here, check yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, coenge.io, like C O E N G dot IO is the URL. And, um, it's pretty crude for now. Yeah. So, wherever yeah i was hoping a graphic would pop up into like the the domain you just said but like go in between my hands <laughs> i'm sure you can do it yeah that's pretty you cool. definitely have special effects people on the team this is a high production <laughs> high production value over here <laughs> you should use like the uh old school microsoft word word art <laughs> like you know yeah, old or, 3D or stuff. Paint. <laughs> <laughs> like hand drawn with your mouse yeah yeah <laughs> i love that but t- so but, tell me, um, so these are like clusters essentially. Like you're creating clusters of knowledge around this, and you can use a natural language in order to actually query these clusters. It sounds like exactly, yeah. It's it's completely meant to be accessible for non technical people. Mm-hmm. Um, which to me, that's kind of the downfall of all these other knowledge graph platforms. Uh, a lot of them are based on RDF, which is a super technical um specification for this for graph data uh i barely understand the bulk of it so it's clearly not going to fulfill that design goal of making it easy for anyone um Mm -hmm. there's stuff like neo for j which is a really awesome graph database but also developers could pretty much only use it so yeah i don't want to ramble too much the the explanation makes sense 
Yeah, definitely ramble, by the way. Keep going. But yeah, like tell me what what excites you about this? Like what is so excited about these uh what is it, nested hypergraphs? Yeah. Yeah, because so they're super flexible. I mean if you maybe I should step back a little bit. If you yeah. look at the normal ways that we store data, by default it's pretty much tables, right? Mm-hmm. And I I would consider that as part of the spectrum of, of flexibility and how much it could express. In order to capture Relational things data. in a table, yeah, you have to uh, have a very defined schema. You need to say like, oh, uh, we have people and we have skills and we have companies and we have to create columns that represent tables and columns that represent these things and their relationships and uh, define um, the exact data types for all the columns, which is great. Like if you want performance by creating these schemas, it tells the database system how to uh, create really fast uh, queries and run it in like a millisecond or less. Um, So it's great. And um, it's a great way to build applications if you're a developer. But if you're trying to capture any any fact you could think of, any idea, any concept, you can every time you have a new kind of idea, you don't want to be going back to a schema and being like, oh shoot, so now we want to store uh, programming languages and and who knows these programs like, oh now we have to go now we need to tap an engineer on on the shoulder and make them update the schema and migrate it, you know, in production and, and do that whole song and dance. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of, that's the default way of storing data. And that's kind of like the trade-off with it. Yeah. Uh, so if you move kind of down the spectrum a little bit, that's where you get into things like uh, document beta- databases, like MongoDB, for example. You could store kind of random JSON objects in there. It has somewhat of a of a schema to it. It should anyways, otherwise it'd be kind of tough to, to query it uh, consistently. Yeah. You keep moving to the right, you get the graph databases. You could kind of very easily add new kinds of nodes and new kinds of relationships. Um, and then if you go all the way to the right, I think it's where it landed, which is nested hypergraphs. You know, you could have an arbitrary relationship between things and you could uh, have a relationship between relationships. And even though it sounds complicated, it just looks like natural language. So it's really, I just find it super interesting. Uh, what the data Who's model using these? What companies are using these things, and what are some applications or use cases they're using it for? I don't have many customers so far. I put it into a couple <laughs> prototypes. I <love. laughs> I'm still, I'm still like very much working on like the API for it. Uh, I've created multiple connectors for different backends, and uh, I'm about to release. Uh, an open source mono repo for all those different adapters. So it'll be uh, right now it's running on uh, Cloudflare durable objects. I could get into those. Cool. They're awesome. Um, yeah, please. Right now it's running on that, the cloud platform. Uh, I've also created adapters for Redis graph, uh, SQL. So if you want to, you can just plug it into an existing database uh, by adding a few tables and uh, Cassandra, which is the column based database. So I'm, I'm going to be releasing this mono repo and it will let people run their own instances. And then I'm going to have the cloud version still, uh, coenge.io, that website. That's all. So yeah, not many customers. I've barely worked on the marketing or trying to get. No, but that's okay. But I meant like what companies are using this type of technology that you saw. So you gave a great example of like, I think you said Google maps on the right hand side, like who else is using this technology? I mean, the the vision is it could just be a platform for any company to store all their data. Because, wow. uh, you know, how like how I mentioned, the initial use case was prolific. Um, yeah. You know, I wanted any sort of data to be in there. So let's say a new employee shows up and they want you want to help onboard them. Like they can look up who's on their team and what they like to do. Do they read any books or watch movies or they like to ride bicycles? Uh, help us assemble teams who has what skills and, you know, you could, uh, given, given a project and its needs, who fit, who fits those needs in your company. And it very easily could run that query for you. Um, yeah, stuff like that. So I, the vision is for it to be 
just a uh, like an application platform that employees could build their own applications on top of. That's awesome. And at, at least it's like a brain to start storing all this data. So then you could build these internal products if you want over time, right? Like it could be <clears throat> as simple as scorecards, maybe to like how different people work all the way to uh, who's on your team. Like you said, if I need a, somebody in our team who writes in Kotlin, but I'm actually not sure, I might be able to just ask it and it might be able to tell me who has experience based yeah. on the resume or something. So there's a brain that you could like build a number of use cases on top of 100 percent, and it was inspired by reading about how brains work by the way that's really so, cool yeah what's the dream state kind of, of this product for you oh sorry god dream state of the product well i've been i've been so focused on the foundations of it um if i get that right then it just becomes a matter of building the right layers on top of it and i think the next layer is um, kind of like a, a general interface. And I'm thinking about using uh, kind of like notebooks where you could, similar to Notion, like kind of imagine Notion, but where you could embed yeah. sections that um, describe stuff in concept engine language, which is called concept ML. Um, and it would automatically pull that data in. And you could also put in queries. So you could have live queries within these documents. And that could kind of be your way of these docs could kind of act as their own little apps and it could kind of be the way of organizing the data too. So create like a user-friendly interface that kind of blends with the way people normally uh, do knowledge management, which is through notion like docs. That's really interesting. Yeah. As we're growing, this is actually becoming more of a use case where like this is ideal when you're small, but as you're growing, it's so important and i would actually love to stick with you on how we can maybe implement this because like i've been waiting till we get to this size to create something called baseball cards which is a way to like write almost like the back of a baseball card like your stats and your skills for each teammate yeah. so we know how to work together yeah because i have a very specific way i like to work with people and that might not be the way other people like to work like i know for example i love to in person collaborate i like to open a doc and let's jam together for the next three hours whereas like justin a teammate of mine likes to actually go off on his own and sit down quietly and then do the work and then come back, right? Things like that are really important. And so like even working style could be a great way to, to um, uh, use this product. That's, that's really cool. So you mentioned it's, it's built using machine learning. How could machine learning teams actually utilize Concept Engine? So yeah, one of, one of the things that is becoming really big right now with AI are vector search databases. Um, so I'm starting to, I'm starting to build that functionality into it. And uh, essentially a vector database, you take text and you get a number, like a, a list of numbers that represent the coordinates of that text in a big space of concepts, essentially. Um, so OpenAI, for example, has a, an API where you send it any text you want. It could be a sentence, a word, a paragraph. And it sends you back those list of numbers. And then you take that list of numbers and you use a service like, uh, there's something called Pinecone. Uh, Redis also has vector search. You, you say, oh, here's a list of numbers. And here's sort of like an ID it's associated with. And then the search part comes into play when you get a query, you send it to that open AI API to get that list of number representation again. And then you go to the vector search database and you're like, Hey, get me everything that is as close as possible to this vector, to this list of numbers. And, um, mm -hmm. so that enables semantic search essentially. Um, so I'm building that into concept engine because what happens there is it will give you the closest concept to your query. Um, it doesn't, it, you don't need to type anything verbatim. It's just like, in that vector space, what's closest to it. And then from there, you could do graph queries on the result, which is, wow. um, I don't know if, if that's a good explanation uh, and makes it sound as cool as it could be, it, would, it could be pretty cool. Yeah. Explain the last thing too. You said vector queries. Yeah. So that, that whole act of taking that list of numbers and asking for other points in that space, um, that are, you know, as close as possible to that, that's the vector search 
uh, portion right there. Okay. And that's what a lot of people are using right now. Like, let's say you're um, like those PDF applications where you, you upload a PDF and then you could have like a chat bot. Essentially what they're doing is they're taking all the fragments of that PDF, turning it into vectors, uh, storing it in a vector database. And then when you're having that uh, chat, it's taking your chat inputs, turning those into vectors and then doing the vector search with it. So that's why so many people are using those databases. So what's the difference between like Pinecone and Redis, for example, like how, how are they different or are they the same? They're just different companies. Um, honestly, I don't, I haven't been using these databases too much where I know like the nuances between them and how different they are. They, they perform the same function. They take a, you know, they take a list of numbers, the vector, and they associate it with 90. They both do that. Pinecone is more okay. of a platform as a service kind of thing. Like you, it's cloud-based. You it. just sign up and then they give you an API key and you hit, you know, a nice endpoint, which concept engine, it's kind of like that too. Uh, whereas Redis, they, they also yeah. have a, uh, a cloud version, but nor, most people tend to run them and manage Redis themselves. Wow. Wow. Really interesting. So this is the technology that excites you right now. Um, it sounds like, is there any other technologies that you're eyeing, um, that you're experimenting with? Um, I think I'm kind of boring in that regard right now. Uh, I'm still playing a lot with Cloudflare. I think in the future, there's going to be a ton of people that are going to notice it because they've been kind of slowly building up their platform and, uh, you know, AWS and, uh, Google and all of them are getting most of the attention. But um, they're, mm -hmm. they're building a bunch of stuff for serverless computing. I mentioned uh, durable objects, which yeah. have their own uh, storage and also do real-time stuff easily. And you could use them. You could set timers to kind of run cron jobs on them. And it's super flexible and all this other stuff that developers love. Um, they just give it yeah. to you for free and it's really cheap and scales. Really? Cool. Yeah. Interesting. So it sounds like Cloudflare people need to keep their eye on. It sounds like that's, they're kind of slowly moving in the background and kind of without a lot of attention, dropping new products and features and services that people can start to utilize. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Very it's cool. not like they're not popular, but I think they're just like still slightly under the radar with how often they are. When it comes to setting up infrastructure, yeah, I don't think about Cloudflare. Like you said, I think about GCP or AWS or, or Azure. So that's really cool that they're building like this suite of services behind the scenes. I think of Cloudflare as security, actually, mostly. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're known for their uh, D, DDoS prevention, right? Like, yeah. yeah, they have that reverse proxy kind of thing. Yeah. yeah so should we wind down? To... Should we have you plug some yeah. stuff? Do you have to hop? Cool. I've, so where can I'm people so, follow yeah. you? Well, I'm on Twitter as Prolific Eric. Uh, pretty much any social thing you could think of, it's Prolific Eric. So, okay, yeah. LinkedIn, Twitter, go check out Concept Engine. Um, is there any other websites they can check out? I think that's the only one worth checking out is uh, the Concept Engine site. What about WordBird? Oh, we We'll talk about WordBird another time. Okay, cool. Well, Eric, this was amazing. Thanks for sitting with me twice for like two hours, essentially each. This was awesome. I think you're so fascinating. Mm -hmm.